Today, we're delving deep into the incredible power of your mind to manifest your reality. I'm going to share with you a belief system that has the potential to change your life in just four days. You see, our minds are incredibly powerful tools, capable of creating the life we desire. But it all starts with understanding the intricate dance between our thoughts, emotions, and beliefs. It's like plugging into a higher voltage, a realm where every cell in your body resonates with the energy energy of your intentions. I've had my own experiences with this phenomenon, these kundalini experiences that felt like being plugged into a cosmic light socket. It's a sensation where you become one with the electricity of the universe, feeling every cell of your body alive and vibrating with potential. Here's the paradox. As you step into this higher state of being, it honors your free will. It's not about waiting for a Maserati to magically appear. It's about actively creating your reality. Wealth creation, for instance, is not a matter of chance. It's about understanding that only gold creates gold. We need to transmute those base emotions of anger, resentment, fear, and anxiety into the gold of abundance. Right on the other side of our pain lies freedom. Beyond our lack is the wealth of abundance. Courage waits on the other side of fear. It's all the same energy trapped within our bodies. By transmuting this energy, we unlock the door to designing a destiny filled with possibilities. As you move into this elegant state of being, expanded and enriched, you'll find it impossible to revert to your old self. Consistent practice is the key. Day by day, this state becomes more familiar and you become a magnet for the miraculous. Let's dive into the topic of creating wealth and nurturing an abundance mindset. This is a key aspect of our journey toward a more fulfilling and prosperous life. It might sound simple, but there's a profound truth in it. You can't invite abundance into your life if your thoughts are fixated on scarcity. Imagine wealth creation as a garden that you're cultivating. Now, in this garden, you plant seeds of positive thoughts and nurture them with the sunlight of optimism. But here's the catch. If you allow the weeds of lack and unworthiness to take root, they'll overshadow the potential growth of abundance. To truly manifest wealth, you need to shift your mindset from dwelling on what you lack to acknowledging and appreciating what you have. It's like turning the soil of your mind, making it fertile ground for the seeds of prosperity. A wealthy person doesn't spend their mental energy worrying about the ticking clock, the limitations of energy, or the scarcity scarcity of money. Instead, they focus on the endless possibilities and the abundance that surrounds them. Think of it this way. If you want to fill a cup with water, you can't do it while thinking about the emptiness of the cup. You have to focus on pouring in the water, celebrating its flow, and appreciating the fullness it brings. Similarly, to create wealth, you have to shift your attention from what you lack to what you can gain. Now let's address the notion of unworthiness. Many times we carry a belief that we don't deserve abundance or success. It's like having a leak in your cup. No matter how much water you pour in, it keeps seeping out. To truly be abundant, you need to repair that leak by acknowledging your worthiness. Picture this. You're standing in front of a magnificent buffet and it's yours to enjoy. But if you carry the belief that you don't deserve to indulge, you'll limit yourself to a meager portion. Abundance is about embracing the fullness of life, and that includes recognizing your worthiness to partake in its richness. By logic and reason, you must lay down the limiting thoughts and step into the state of being where abundance flows effortlessly. Remember, once you're in that state, you can't sit idly and wait. You must make choices into the unknown, trusting in the process and the unknown itself. Trusting the unknown is a fundamental aspect of this belief system. The moment you doubt your creation and hesitate in making choices, you revert back to the known. Miracles happen when you decide to go for it, not as your limited emotional self, but as your unlimited self. Now let's discuss the key to making this belief system work for you, morning priming. There are two crucial times when the door to the subconscious mind swings open, when you wake up in the morning and when you go to bed at night. Understanding brainwave patterns is essential. 
In the morning, as your receptors pick up light, serotonin production begins, aligning you with the daytime neurotransmitter. At night, as darkness falls, the shift to melatonin, the nighttime neurotransmitter, prepares you for rest. Altering your brainwave patterns is the secret sauce. If you wake up early, your brainwaves are likely in theta or alpha, taking you into the subconscious. The same applies if you stay up late, like some artists and musicians who thrive in the alpha state during the nighttime. Achieving an alpha state is incredible, but the magic happens when you slip into theta. Theta is where your body is asleep, but your mind is wide awake. In this state, resistance fades away, paving the way for instantaneous change. Be cautious not to slip into delta, the deep sleep state. If you meditate in bed, you're fast-tracking to Delta, missing the potential of Theta. Our research shows that coherence in Alpha can lead to a seamless transition into Theta, unlocking a realm of relaxation and energy alignment. Memory plays a vital role in shaping who we are and how we experience the world. It's like a mental filing system that stores our thoughts and feelings based on past experiences. In this journey of self-discovery and transformation, understanding how memory works is absolutely crucial. Our thoughts and feelings, the very essence of our being, are deeply connected to our past. Imagine your brain as a complex network of pathways, each representing a different memory etched in your mind. These neural circuits reflect our personal history, forming the foundation of our attitudes toward life. Memories aren't just random bits of information. They're created through the interplay of sensory data and emotions. Picture a moment in your life when something significant happened, perhaps a joyful celebration or a challenging experience. The sights, sounds, and feelings of that moment become woven into the fabric of your memory, influencing how you perceive and respond to similar situations in the future. Now let's talk about learning and how it shapes the connections in your brain. Learning something new is like adding new branches to the intricate network of your neural circuitry. When you acquire semantic information, you're not just storing facts, you're organizing your brain circuitry. It's as if you're expanding the map of your mental landscape, creating new pathways for thoughts and experiences to travel. Experiences in particular play a significant role in enriching your brain. Every new encounter, every challenge faced, and every triumph experienced contributes to the wealth of your mental resources. Think of it as a continuous process of building upon what you already know, creating a reservoir of knowledge and wisdom that shapes your understanding of the world. Now let's delve into the emotional aspect of this journey. Emotions are the driving force behind our feelings and attitudes, and they play a pivotal role in determining our state of being. Your thoughts communicate with your brain, and your feelings communicate with your body. It's a dynamic exchange that influences how you perceive and navigate through life. Consider the power of positive thinking coupled with positive feelings. When you align your thoughts with optimism and pair them with uplifting emotions, you're creating a harmonious synergy. This combination forms a powerful attitude that shapes your overall state of being. It's like tuning into a positive frequency that attracts good things into your life. On the flip side, negative thoughts connected to negative feelings can lead to a challenging attitude. Imagine a day when everything seems to go wrong and you find yourself caught in a cycle of pessimistic thinking. These negative thoughts send signals to your body, influencing your emotions and ultimately shaping your attitude. It's a reminder that the relationship between thought and feeling is a two-way street, and being mindful of this connection is crucial in our journey of self-transformation. The belief system I've shared with you is not a theoretical concept. It's a practical approach to transforming your life. By understanding the dynamics of your mind, emotions, and beliefs, and by actively engaging in the creation of your reality, you can manifest your desires in just four days. So how come nothing new ever happens in our life? I mean, the quantum law works, and we know that it does. Then how come we keep having the same relationships or the same jobs or the same circumstances in our life? 
How come it's so routine and predictable that it seems that Newtonian physics is the law? Because we haven't mastered this idea called observation. So this one particular researcher says, well, who do I know that knows how to pay attention really well? So he gets on the phone and he calls a Dalai Lama and he says, can you send me your eight best guys? I mean, I want to study these guys and I want to see what happens in their brain when they're focusing on a single-minded thing like compassion or divinity or unconditional love. Now, these guys, by the way, had over 40,000 hours of focused meditation. They spent over 40 years practicing while you were laying on the beach. They were focusing on single-minded thoughts. And then they said, let's take a control group just a group of people that are just average people and we'll use the monks and we'll teach them how to do this thing called focused concentration, what science is now called paying attention. By the way, the average human being loses their attention span six to 10 times a minute. That's why only a few subatomic particles actually pay attention to our mind. So he said, okay, we're gonna hook these guys up to these brain scans, particular ones called EEGs. And EEGs measure electromagnetic frequency that the brain admits. And so they took 256 electrodes and they covered their whole entire head. Can you picture these monks with the things, and then they ran all the feedback into a computer that created a holographic picture of the brain, and they were able to begin to measure brain activity. They said to these monks, be your normal self. They took eight of them, be your normal self. And then they said, okay, now listen, you guys, pay attention to compassion. Just close your eyes and pay attention to compassion. The moment they did that, all of a sudden, the frontal lobe lit up so much that the scientists had never seen that type of activity in that part of the brain. Now then they took the control group and they said, all right, you guys pay attention to one thing. And of course, what happened? My back hurts. How long is this gonna take? I don't really wanna do this. Am I doing it right? I wonder what my kid's doing. I gotta buy dinner, you know, all that stuff. And guess what happened to their frontal lobe? Meh, nothing, nothing. Now, in one particular monk, there's a part of the frontal lobe on the left side, which is really the happy spot in the brain. And this guy's left frontal lobe was so ignited that the scientists said, this guy's got to be the happiest guy in the world. They'd never seen activity like this before. But then the scientists began to think about this, and what they said was, you know, maybe paying attention and concentration and observation is a skill, just like tennis or golf and you can improve it if you keep practicing it. Now think about this. The brain is the instrument that we use. It's the machinery for us to process thought. How many people will accept that? And it also has some automatic processes that allow us to function. But for the most part, it's the greatest area in the body where there's the greatest number of neurons clustered together. And where you have the greatest number of neurons clustered together, you have the greatest intelligence. So the brain is the central clearinghouse of intelligence. Mind, by the way, is what the brain does. Mind is the brain in action. It's the brain at work. When we can measure a working brain, we're studying mind. So mind is when the brain is in action. So when we're using functional brain scans and we're studying how the brain works, we're studying this concept called mind. Then here's my question. If the brain is the instrument for intelligence or processing thought, and mind is what the brain does, if you can improve the way your brain works, who's doing the improving? And it's that nasty 13-letter word called consciousness. That's the only solution. Consciousnesses are self-aware, free-willed individual that is really not the body, is not the brain, and is not the mind. As a matter of fact, consciousness is what manipulates the brain to produce mind. The brain processes 400 billion bits of information every second, but we're only aware of about 2,000 of those 400 billion bits of information. And you know what those 2,000 bits of information have to do with? Three things and only three things, the body, the environment, and time. That's it. You know, does your back hurt? Do you have a headache? Are you tired? Is it too cold in here? Is it too bright in here? Is it too dark in here? Do you like the way the person smells sitting next to you? Do you even like the person next to you? How long is this guy gonna talk before we can break? 
and that's where all of our self-awareness is on. It's only on the body, the environment, and time, and yet billions of bits of information is being processed by the brain. Now, when we can take consciousness, self-awareness, and move it away from the body, the environment, and time, we no longer have to live by the laws of the body, the environment, and time. And when we're able to do that, we begin to open the door to walk into the quantum field. So then the first step to change is becoming conscious of those unconscious states of mind and body. Most people don't like to do this. Everybody knows this, that you keep switching on that system for an extended period of time, and you live by the arousal of fear, the arousal of pain, the arousal of suffering, the arousal of aggression. It takes energy to activate those late systems. And when we do that, our immune system is compromised. The energy that's mobilized for emergency, for the threat in the outer environment, compromises the energy in our inner environment. And we are then more susceptible to the conditions in our outer environment. And as Greg said, you have to look at to see what keeps you in balance. And stress and living in survival is when you're not that balanced, not that homeostasis. We can tolerate that short term, but if you keep exposing yourself to the same stimulation or you have the thought of some worst case scenario in your mind, you're actually knocking your brain and body out of balance by thought alone. And this is where it gets dangerous because the conditioning response, the worst case scenario, the image we created in our mind and the emotion that we perceive is the stimulus response that's conditioning the body to subconsciously live by the arousal of fear, as an example. So that internal environment becomes compromised and immune system dials down. And why is that? Because we are more reactionary or responding more to the environment. So, and Greg, you know this, that in a time like this, when everybody's feeling fear, that seems natural and normal. But what we're looking for is supernatural. And that's the new consciousness that has to emerge as a result of this wake up call. This is a perfect opportunity for people to be in a retreat. But instead of being in some tent or some hut in the Himalayas or being, you know, in some hotel, you're in the comfort of your own home. And it's true. You break from routine and you're not going to the same place and seeing the same people and doing the same thing. And that causes you to step outside of familiar territory. So then when we practice the inward work, when we practice meditation as an example, and you have the ability to take a moment and be present and truly open your heart, our research shows that you are going to actually create a state of information that's no longer coming from your outer world, that there's danger in there. But when you start falling into the present moment and opening your heart, your immune system in four days can strengthen by 50%. Now, I know most people will say, I don't really want to do it now. It's just too hard. No, no, no. This is the time. This is the time that we've been practicing for. This is the time where it matters the most. These are the tools that we've learned. So what information then is your body receiving? Is it receiving danger in the outer world or in a meditation? It could feel safe enough that it can move into the present moment. Going from the old self to the new self is the neurological, is the biological, is the chemical, the hormonal genetic death of the old self. People who say to me, I'm in the river of change, I'm in the unknown, I'm in this void, I can't predict my future, I always say the same thing to them, the best way to predict your future is to create it. Not from the known, but from the unknown. What thoughts do you want to fire and wire in your brain? You can't wait for your wealth to feel abundance. You can't wait for your success to feel empowered. You can't wait for the mystical moment to feel awe. You can't wait for your new relationship to feel love or your new job to feel gratitude. It's the old model of reality, of cause and effect, waiting for something outside of you to change how you feel inside of you. When you feel differently inside of you, you pay attention to whoever or whatever caused that. And that event in and of itself is called a memory, to wait for our environment to give us relief. The quantum model of reality is about causing and effect, which means when you feel whole, you begin to heal. When you feel empowered, you're going to be successful. When you're worthy enough, you'll feel abundant. When you are in love with life and in love with yourself, you will find an equal or it will find you. 
And when you are in awe of the moment, the mystical is going to bless you in a way that you never anticipated. And when you are in a state of gratitude, your job is on the way. It's causing an effect. And by the way, what is the emotional signature of gratitude? Don't you give thanks when you get something or you receive something? So then, what if you were to begin to give thanks or feel thanks before it manifested? Would your body as the unconscious mind believe it's in the future experience in the present moment? Because gratitude is the ultimate state of receivership. And so, we don't pray in our work to have our prayers answered. We get up as if our prayers are already answered. It is that state of mind and body that I know that requires a clear intention and an elevated emotion. And the clear intention is an act of the mind and the brain. And an elevated emotion is when you open your heart. When you combine those two elements, you just moved from living in your past to living in your future. So then, here's the question. Can you believe in a future that you can't see or experience with your senses yet, but you've thought about enough times in your mind that your brain is literally changed to look like the experience has already occurred? Can you fall in love with a future potential that already exists in the quantum field? And how many potentials exist in the quantum field? Infinite potentials in the quantum field. Can you select a new potential in the quantum field and emotionally embrace that future reality before it's made manifest to such degree that your body as the unconscious mind is believing it's living in that future reality in the present moment and you're signaling new genes and new ways? If there's physical evidence, physical evidence in your brain and body to look like the experience has already happened, there's evidence there physically by thought alone. Relax. Because the experience is going to find you. There's an intelligence that's giving you life right now. It's keeping your heart beating and digesting your food and organizing trillions of functions in every single cell of your body. It's organizing mutations in your DNA. There's some invisible force that's giving you life, but that same intelligence that's keeping your heart beating and digesting your food is the same intelligence that's creating supernovas in distant galaxies and causing flowers to bloom. It's both personal and universal. It's within you and it's all around you and you can't see it and you can't smell it and you can't taste it and you can't feel it, but it is the giver of life and it is a consciousness. And consciousness is awareness, and awareness is paying attention, and it is the observer observing you into life. And you know when I tell our advanced students, either you're going to be defined by a vision of the future or the memories of the past, and then people say, why are you so bitter? Why are you so frustrated? Why are you suffering so much? And your brain, in that emotion, you're in the emotion, which means you're in the chemical residue of the past is going to call up the event because you're emotionally connected to it and you're going to say, I'm this way because of that past experience. So then, imagine what I do with people. We have people that have been abused. We have people that have been traumatized, that have been assaulted. We have people that have had very, very difficult, difficult pasts. And have you ever heard me say to revisit the event. Have you ever heard me say that? Never do we need to revisit the event because once you do, you open the box. But what we want to do is overcome the emotion because that's just what's lasting from the event. So you sit a person down and the moment you sit them down, what do you think the body is going to do? It's going to look for something to recreate that emotion because that's the person's identity. Are you with me still? So if I make the person if I inspire the person to sit there and they're sitting there and all of a sudden they're noticing that they're hot and they're irritated and their stomach is twisting and all of a sudden it's a group of sensations, a group of feelings that they have called all along frustration. But the different sensations, the moment you name it, it becomes an emotion. But what it is is just bodily sensations. It's energy that's stuck in the body. So the body is looking to go back to the past. It's believing it's in the past. Are you with me still? So if the person becomes aware that their body is doing that 
and like training an animal, allow the body to feel that emotion and then settle it down into the present moment. When you settle it down into the present moment, the body starts to trust the present moment and move out of the past. And there's a release of energy. Then the body goes, wait a second, what's going to happen in the next moment? And it starts doing that. And it starts to try anticipate the future. And you settle the body back down into the present moment. And every time you do that, you're telling the body it's no longer the mind, that you're the mind. And your will is getting greater than the program and all of a sudden you start to lower the volume to that emotion. And when you begin to break the addiction to that emotion, the side effect of breaking that addiction is called joy. It's called freedom. All of a sudden the body's saying, I don't wanna be tormented anymore. Now, does that mean you shouldn't grieve over things that you lose? Grieving is a biological process. It's neural pruning. It's a death of circuitry. It's a death of emotions. It's the absence of void of something in your life. And that's important. In grief, sooner or later, you've got to come to a greater understanding about death, a greater understanding about loss, a greater understanding so that you can adapt to those conditions. Every time I sit with someone and they start complaining about their life, and I let them go for a few minutes, and then I go, oh, you know what I say to them? You only complain about your life when it's not working. And the emotion that you're feeling right now is keeping you connected to the past. You never do this when your life is working. And so I don't have a problem with moving through the stages of emotions. But I also know that what a person really wants more than anything else is to be free. People want to be free. And I have witnessed transformation on every culture, on every skin color, every shape, every size, every age. I've witnessed it. If there's physical evidence in your brain and body to look like the event has already occurred, your brain and body are no longer living in the past, they're living in the future, and you will walk right into your vision, something new you wanted to experience. And the moment you started thinking about this experience, the moment you started contemplating this potential reality, you turned on a part of your brain called the frontal lobe, the crowning achievement of the human being. It's 40% of your entire brain. It is the creative center, and it has connections to all other parts of the brain. And the moment you said, what would it be like to be a leader? What would it be like to be successful? What would it be like to have this vision come true? The moment you asked that open-ended question, you turned on this part of the brain because the rest of the brain is just a bunch of automatic programs. And now the frontal lobe, the creative center wakes up and it has connections to the entire brain. It's the CEO, it's the boss, it's the symphony leader of the brain. And the moment you get creative, the frontal lobe begins to select different networks of neurons that are stored in your brain from things you've learned or experienced. And as you begin to think a what-if question, it begins to select these different networks and begins to seamlessly piece them together and making your brain fire in new sequences and in new patterns and new combinations. And whenever you make your brain work differently, you're changing your mind because mind is the brain in action. Mind is the brain at work. And the moment those neurons fire in tandem, you get a picture in your mind, a hologram, a vision. For those people who are passionate, that thought that they're thinking begins to create an elevated emotion. They become inspired. They feel enthusiastic. They become passionate. They started to open their hearts. And all of a sudden, they're combining a clear intention with an elevated emotion. And it's the combination of a clear intention and an elevated emotion in our research over and over again that proves then the person now is changing fundamentally, changing biologically, changing internally. And their brain and body are moving from living in the past into living in the future. When you do that, when you had that moment, you came out of your resting state and then you started to write down all the things you were going to do to get to that vision, all the choices you were going to make. Make, all of the experiences or goals you wanted to achieve and all of the emotions and the joy you would feel. 
And when you were doing that, you were setting your sights towards that destiny. And then you did something really brilliant. You wrote down the choices you weren't going to make. You became aware of the behaviors you weren't going to demonstrate. You began to review certain experiences you wanted to stay away from. And then you looked at the emotions that would bring you to a lower level, and you began to separate the old self from the new self. And when you begin to do that and you're observing the old self, it means you're no longer the program. Now you're the consciousness observing the program. And that's when you begin to objectify your subjective self. And so the moment you stop making the same choices that you always make, get ready because it's going to be uncomfortable. And that's the moment you're heading towards the new self. Do you think that you can change the circuits in your brain by thinking about it? So I did this experiment a little ways back. It took these people who never played the piano before and they separated them into four categories and they said, listen, we're going to scan your brains before you learn this exercise and then we're going to scan your brain after and all you have to do is show up for two hours a day in practice for two weeks, okay? And just follow the instructions and we're gonna hook your brain up to these sophisticated scans and we're gonna see what happens before and after so they got with these people and they said okay first group here's the scales and here's the chords they're one-handed exercises practice them over and over again keep playing them so they played every single day two hours a day for two weeks they scanned their brains before, they scanned their brains after. After two weeks, guess what happened? Whole new set of circuits lit up in their brain that never lit up before. That makes sense. You learn something new. Learning is making new connections. Repeating it over and over again is sustaining or maintaining those connections, and that's called memory. So they memorized what they were doing by physically practicing or personalizing what they learned. Make sense? Yes standard, simple. It took the second group of people and they said, listen, we want you to play two hours a day for two weeks. We're going to scan your brain before and after. You know what we're going to do? We're not going to tell you how to play anything. You just come and do whatever you want. Play whatever you want. So at the end of two weeks, guess what happened to them? Nothing. You know why? Because they couldn't remember what they had learned the day before. And they couldn't remember what they played the day before and they had no structure. They got no instruction and no knowledge to be able to apply it to make some steady circuits. It took the third group of people and they said, listen, don't even show up. Don't even create your day. Same thing, nothing happens. The last group of people, they said, listen, we want you to come two hours a day for two weeks. We're going to show you these one-handed exercises, but instead of you physically playing the piano, we want you to mentally rehearse over and over again those exercises. We know you're going to get tired, so we'll nudge you and we'll keep you awake. But you practice for two hours a day and you keep repeating those. The end of two weeks, they rescan their brain and guess what happened? Same area of the brain lit up as if they were actually playing the scales.